And now you have people who can be making, you know, up to $80,000 right out of high school, great paying jobs, uh, being able to afford better lives for their families. And so as simple as that sound, there's a lot that goes into that and really creating the infrastructure, the transportation, the skills, the support to get more and more of our folks living uh, away from the water connected to these great blue jobs. Hello, I'm Jeff Lackey, the host of your show, Growing Your Business with People, a video podcast dedicated to CEOs and business leaders who want to learn how to grow their business with people. Today, we have a very special guest in Helena Folks. She's a colleague of mine from the CVS days and a former CEO of Hudson Bay Company. You can thank Saks Fifth Avenue. She was also president of the CVS retail division with nearly 180,000 colleagues within her organization. She's a former Democratic candidate for governor of Rhode Island. She's also executive chair of the Follett Higher Education Group, the board chair of PM Pediatrics, as well as board members of Harry's, Skillsoft, and CEO advisory board at Salesforce. She's also served on the board of overseers at Harvard and as, uh, as a member of the board of directors at the Home Depot among many other things. With all this leadership experience, I cannot wait for you to experience the amazing person that I know is Helena Folks. Welcome, Helena. Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. I count it a privilege. My family will tell you that uh, that I've been waiting all like uh, for these past month. I've been talk all I can talk about is uh, I can't wait to interview Helena, folks. She's gonna be uh, she's gonna be the the highlight of uh, of the season. This Very is exciting. Nice. So I, I know that you're one of the most purpose driven people that I I have ever worked with. You help lead CVS through a, an important pivot and transition to quit smoking. You also served as an inspiration to myself and anyone who meets you. Can you tell us a little bit more about where this purpose-centered attitude comes from? Well, I think it comes from my parents, honestly, and, and my grandparents and my family. Family is incredibly important to me. And I grew up uh, with a mother and a father who were both very passionate about service and serving people in their community. And my mother in particular was just incredibly warm and, you know, was giving and everyone who was in her orbit felt her love. And so I think that I was lucky enough to feel that. And she had come from a family that was full of public service in terms of, of, of serving in office. But my dad was a relatively small business owner. And I uh, really, for me, the power of, I didn't feel that those were in conflict. I think oftentimes people think of going into a life of service or business. And I thought about it as an and proposition, one where you could do both, no matter where you are, about the idea of really listening. Mostly I'd say listening to people who are closest to the customer and understanding. And I think. That's what my parents did so well. They were really listeners. And by listening so intently, I learned so much. I, one of my favorite things was always going to a CVS pharmacy and just standing there and watching and listening at the counter and watching the incredible passion of the people who work there, but some of the pain points too, and thinking about how I could as their leader make their lives better. And I think that when you focus on serving the people who are serving your customers, uh, you end up making their lives better, but also the customers you serve and it creates a, a, like a success wheel. And so for me, I was always drawn by that, by that idea of serving people who worked at the company. And then we could talk about it more, but it became a, in some ways, natural transition to move into trying to be in a life of public service as well. So I've been really fortunate to be part of a great family. Oh, that's fantastic. What an amazing virtuous cycle that you was created. Started off with your mom, your dad, small yeah. business owner, a mom who who really fills the house with love and 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 uh and warmth, right? And right. then it turns it into somebody who knows how to listen, you know, knows how to listen from the customer perspective. And also from the employee perspective, and then to 
makes you actually feel like that you're the only person in the room. So what a what an amazing gift. What an amazing yeah, gift. Yeah, it was I'm a gift. Just... This podcast is brought to you by 7-Step, a leading global workforce solutions provider that offers recruitment process outsourcing, MSP services to manage the flexible workforce, including suppliers and contractors, and total talent solutions for managing the entire permanent and flexible workforce supply. Their people are great, and so is their technology, particularly their Surveo Insights data and intelligence platform. It's really cutting edge, not only in how it brings your talent data together, but in how it draws deep, detailed, predictive intelligence. It's really like a crystal ball for your talent data. I used 7-Step at my previous two organizations, and their team helped us to launch a full-service RPO to staff healthcare workers customer service reps, IT professionals, data science and engineering, digital design teams, along with aerospace engineers and manufacturing workers. Their talent analytics put data at my fingertips, which allowed me to see around corners and strategically plan for frequent and volatile market changes, including a global pandemic where we had to hire literally hundreds of thousands of people. Their deep knowledge and exceptional integrity allowed me to rely on them as a trusted partner across multiple lines of business. Go to 7stepRPO.com to learn more about the powerful things 7step can do for you. One of the things that I think about, you know, and I know a lot of folks are aware, is that while you have led large corporations, um, enormous corporations, but you've also transitioned and been leading some not-for-profits recently, mm-hmm. and that can be hugely different. I know yeah. you have a big passion for the public-private partnerships and how we can use those to close the opportunity gap in terms of both education and employment. Can you tell mm-hmm. me about this work that you're doing and why you think other CEOs and other business and government leaders should be equally invested in this type of work? Well, I I love what I'm doing right now because you're absolutely right. And I think it goes back to what I was describing before. It's neither public service nor just for profit that there's this beautiful convergence in the and of both worlds. And so my life right now is really filled, mostly focused on education and healthcare, both for profit and non for profit. And I, I feel like I'm learning so much every day from both worlds and really trying very much to make this a, you know, a better place. But if we just focus on education, which was the number one issue I, I talked about in my campaign for governor, um, we live in a state in Rhode Island where only 33% of our kids pass their grade level reading tests and 20% in math. And so there's an enormous K through 12 opportunity. But there's also real work that's going on. And Jeff, you're a big part of this too, in terms of workforce development and making sure that adults get to have great wages and great careers, regardless of whether they've gone to college or not. And I think in in all ends of this spectrum, in many ways, what I've become is a coach. How do I help coach the leaders get to the goals that they have? So, for example, I've got two mayors who I'm supporting right now in Rhode Island. And when I say supporting, I just mean giving my time as an ear for them. Uh, One of them is the mayor of Central Falls. One of them is the mayor of Johnston. But in both cases, we've talked about this before, being the top of any organization can feel very lonely sometimes. And what I can do is be there for them and help them think about the most important decisions they make, which is the people they put in those jobs, and then whether they're making good strategic choices with their dollars. Um, But then, you know, i I get the joy also of working in for-profit organizations where we're working on skilled space training and developing our workforce so that they're ready for the future. And I think that leaders of today, whether you're in the public or the private sector, there's more convergence than ever. And I think when both sides of the equation can come together, that's when we can really make explosive gains for the people that live in our communities. And that's what we all want. We want people to have you know, to reach the earnings capacity that they have to get the skills they need to give their families great lives. That really gives me a sense of purpose. So one of the things that I took from that is that 
really at the top, you need to seek out mentors and advisors such as yourself and others that, that you can trust and that you can listen to because they can really help shape your uh, how you, maybe not all your decisions, but they can certainly shape how you come to your decisions, right? Yes, that's right. And how right. you lead different, right? Yeah. And by the way, selfishly for me, I learned from these experiences too. So as you think about finding your own mentors, no matter where you are, remember you, you bring a gift to your mentor as well, which is you're teaching him or her about the experiences of the folks you're serving. And that's a gift for me as much as I'm able to support them. I still remember mentoring a, uh, a store manager at CVS and what an, a learning opportunity ended exactly. up. Uh, I, 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 I'm too good at my job. So I ended up recruiting her onto my recruiting team uh, <laughs> over time. But, but right. that was after you left. Don't worry. Linda. It was not before you left. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and just, but the empathy for what she was going through, the, 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 the yeah. customer, the balancing of the customer, the supply chain, the needs, the stocking, you know, the, you know, the needs of the pharmacy, as well as the front store and, and how all those things came in balance. Even as, as simple as like, what's the stock room have to look like? And whenever, you know, whenever put p- people put things away out of order, you know, that she ends up spending an entire weekend trying to fix all of that stuff that's put away the wrong way. You're like, you're sitting there going, wow, mm-hmm. that's, that's a level of commitment from somebody who was, you know, not making a tremendous yeah. amount of money, but who is, who is spending a lot of their personal, you know, their personal time, you know, investing back in the company. It really, it was inspiring to mentor them. So, so well, let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important because I serve, we've talked about this. I'm, I serve as a board chair for Skills for Rhode Island's future. And I also see the need for us to close this opportunity gap I'd love to hear some examples, you know, because you spent time with these organizations. I think you're starting to talk about this. Any stories that you might have that could illuminate for our audience the impact that these organizations have on real people every day? I'll give you uh, a couple of stories from uh, Central Falls that are hot in my head right now. In Central Falls, we have 800 kids in the high school and there's one public high school. And so 200 kids graduate every year. And of that 200, uh, only 15% of them go on to college. So that's roughly 30 kids go to college. And then you have 170 other kids who are suddenly in the workforce. And you know the conversation we've been having is, obviously, I think it makes sense to try to get more of them in a place where they could attend college. Not everyone has to go, but probably the mayor often says uh, that she wasn't considering college when she was at that phase of her life at Central Falls High School. So having adults in your life who encourage you is really important, but also making sure that uh, these young adults have the skills they need for jobs of the future. And in Rhode Island, One of the things that's really exciting is the resources we have related to the water, to the ocean, to the rivers. I call it the blue economy. It's a booming potential in our state. And there are and will be more good paying jobs in that sector. Defense is here, lots of things that relate to underwater technology. And so how do we take the kids who are leaving Central Falls and connect them to the jobs of the future along the water, whether in Quonset or connected to University of Rhode Island in Bristol, Newport. And today there's a huge divide. There's a skills gap and your organization Mm -hmm. is helping fill that. In fact, uh, your organization, Jeff, thank you, is going to be sponsoring a good number of Central Falls high school students this summer in the program to teach them the skills they need for the future. Um, But then it also gets down to very basic things. For example, transportation. One of the key barriers to a lot of the folks in Central Falls getting some of these great paying jobs in Quonset, where there's a need for workers, is they don't have transportation to get there. And I remember one of the stories that really inspired me was a group of business leaders in the manufacturing sector who had come together and they had a need in their businesses and and the barrier was transportation. So they worked with RIPTA, the transportation organization, and they they started getting organizing to get public transportation buses 
going from, let's say, Central Falls to Quonset. It's such a basic concept, right? So that's just one area that I feel like that is the role of government and that's the role of leaders is to be a connective tissue between these for-profit, not-for-profit and town-oriented resources where if we just provide the right support, we can really uh, enable great lives for the people of the state. What a great way to put it is being that connective tissue to to bring the people and the resources together to solve problems that one company couldn't solve for itself. Nope. Right. And exactly one group, right. One town couldn't solve for itself. But right. But if you pull everybody together and get things, get people collaborating. They think differently. They start solving stuff with RIPTA or whatever the solution might be. And that's yes. uh, that's exciting. What a what a tremendous example. And and I think and I think about this, I think it takes the business leaders, it takes the government leaders, it takes the not for profits, it takes the community leaders, it takes people from all of these walks, you know, and and as I've, um, I was just uh, asked to lead this outreach event, and I have a group of volunteers. Well, you know something? That's a whole different level of, uh, of, uh, of diversity. Whenever you're talking about people from every perspective, every walk of life, every, you know, and they all want to contribute their time and their, and their, and their energy, but yet they have so many different perspectives on everything under the sun. And it's that same thing with the government leaders. Like you're taking all that energy and trying to find a way to, you know, to make it impactful and have a uh, have the impact that you want it to have. This podcast is brought to you by Paradox AI, also known as Olivia, recruiting's most advanced AI assistant. I use Paradox at my previous organization and their team helped us create a candidate concierge experience that ensured a fast hiring process that still felt very human. We literally hired hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom were critical healthcare workers needed during the pandemic. She would let them know we had an interview or offer waiting and would help them navigate onboarding processes. Olivia made the experience easy and fast, two essential ingredients in recruiting great people. It's not just me. Organizations like McDonald's, General Motors, Unilever, and L'Oreal use this technology to create engaging and fast candidate experiences. Go to Paradox.ai to learn more about the amazing things Paradox and Olivia can do for you. So you've led teams of hundreds of thousands with over tens of billions in revenue. You've led these teams But that may seem very daunting to somebody who is listening or watching the show who may only have 50, 100, 200 employees, maybe not even that, maybe only have 10 or 15. Mm -hmm. What experiences do you attribute really shaped how you chose to lead and and what lessons uh, that they might be able to take away from this did you uh, take away from those experiences? Well, sure. I think that I'm, I'm a work in process. I think we all are right to become great leaders and I work on it every day. And part of what I uh, love is being inspired by other great leaders and, and size doesn't always equate to great leadership, right? There are, there are amazing leaders of very small organizations, but I've actually had a professional coach for the last 15 years and I share that because I think we need coaches in lots of aspects of our lives. So whether it's an informal coaching opportunity you have with a mentor or something more formal, that's one thing that I have benefited from tremendously. So I will put that out there. And as part of my own leadership journey, I have a, I would say leadership uh, philosophy, which I really follow and And so I incorporate it in every new job I have. And it starts with having a really clear purpose and a sense of what will make you and your team proud and and igniting in your team a sense of pride. And that's relevant whether you have 10 people working for you or 10,000 people working for you. It's what is going to make us proud. We can get so caught up in our everyday uh, achievements that we need to accomplish that we forget the big picture of, why are we here? What's our purpose? What will make us proud? 
Um, another key part of this is really, I think, I think I, I've worked at, and now it's become quite natural, um, getting my leadership teams to talk about their emotions at work, talk about what makes them excited, what makes them scared, what makes them angry. And by talking about our work from an emotional perspective, uh, not living in an either or world, but, but getting teams to see that those conflicting emotions are actually quite powerful and they can tap into and lead to more creative solutions if you're really listening and working together on them. We can talk more about that. But that became this paradox and complexity notion became a big unlock for me as I was leading teams to more creative solutions. Because I promise you, I was never the one with the big breakthrough ideas. I think it was just pulling people together so that we could do them. And the third thing I would say is a notion of returning authority. And what I mean by that is the definition of returning authority is something I'm unwilling or unable to do. And when I arrived at one of my one of my roles, I found that very, very senior people in the organization were all looking to me to make every decision. And of course, that comes over time from a culture where they had been sort of beaten down by making bad decisions. So they were smart people. They said, well, I won't make the decisions anymore. I'll send it upstairs. Uh, and the problem with that is it slows the organization down. And so I, I, I like having a word for it or two words, returning authority, because it can create a framework for a dialogue where you know someone might come to me and say, Helena, you really need to help me decide this or make this decision. And I would say, you know, John, this is something I'm unwilling or unable to do. You, in fact, know more about this problem than I do. I could be your thought partner. But at the end of the day, you're going to make the decision. I'm going to back you. Or there are other times where I might say, Joan, I want, I want you to return the authority to me on this one because this is a major spend of capital. And this is one that I, I think I need to be involved in. So those are just three examples, purpose, paradox, complexity, and returning authority that are parts of my leadership philosophy. And I share those with every team that I'm working with. And just e even recently running for governor, we talked a lot about our purpose and all those elements so that we could be a good functioning team. Well, it's interesting that you talk about this in such a, a, a clear framework, right, Helena? And, and I think that a lot of leaders could take away from this to say, you know, how do I even frame up my leadership style? Like, what, where do I begin? Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, what well, do I need to a vision, a mission, a you know, this and that, and another thing? And by, before you're done, like you got like 500 pages, and Too nobody much. knows what yeah. any of it is, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I loved uh, one of our CVS when I first joined, uh, helping people on their path to better health. Rolls right off the tongue. Yeah. Right? You're just you're immediately drawn to it. You can remember it. Um, you know, we would talk about the values. Uh, actually, that's a big reason why I joined CVS is because oh, it's a, a purpose-driven, value-centric organization. And I, and I love the fact, I tell people all the time, yeah. I say, if you can find somebody who can resonate with your purpose and who reflects your values, you have a winner. You may not know where in the organization they belong, but they probably belong somewhere, right? Well, you know? that's, it's such a good example. And I, I want to, I don't know if you know this story behind that, Jeff, but you know, I had grown up in the retail side of the business and our, mm -hmm. our mission was helping people live longer, healthier, happier lives. And then suddenly we started buying healthcare companies and we, the first big one was Caremark. There were others that came, but what we realized was we needed to have a connective purpose, one that transcended any particular business unit. So we actually spent a long time interviewing people in each organization saying, why do you come to work every day? You know, what motivates you? And out of it came that exact purpose that you're describing. And, um, and so what I loved about that, that that was not, you know, some marketing team or some HR team. It was real people in the organization who were articulating their own purposes. And we were just the voices for that that could reflect that back to them. And it showed. Because I remember meetings, people talking about, well, that really doesn't reflect this value uh -huh. or that doesn't reflect that value or how does this fit within our purpose? And I've never been a part of an organization that would have actually had those conversations, and even with brands like Rolls Royce and others in the past. 
you know, we still never had conversations at that level and really making foundational decisions based on the purpose of your organization, which is obviously the the genesis of the quit smoking campaign, which you were front and center, a big part of. It was right about the time whenever you guys uh, changed to CVS Health, yep. you announced your new purpose statement, your values, and also quit smoking kind of almost all within a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So I had been at the company for over 20 years at that point. Every year we would talk about our purpose and some brave soul would raise his or her hand and say, if that's our purpose, why do we still sell cigarettes? And that was that like awkward moment where you'd say, oh, that's because we have to make money. We're a public company. <laughs> but you knew that wasn't really right. And uh, I would say the, the drumbeat got louder after we bought Caremark and we became you know, really a healthcare company. In other words, we were starting to go into hospital systems to talk to health plans about all the great services we could provide as their healthcare partner. And suddenly the doctors started saying, but how can you still sell cigarettes? Which at the time, cigarettes were killing 480,000 people every year in the United States. Um, for me, this was really personal. My mother had died of lung cancer. And so I had lost her in 2009. And it was, you know, to lose a parent's a terrible thing, but to lose someone that way is, is r really devastating. And so, yes, I was always trying to sort of figure out how to satisfy this deep personal connection I had to the impact that I could have as a leader in, in, in corporate America. And it was hard. We came together as a whole leadership team under the CEO. I was, I was part of, you know, a lot of conversations, hard conversations. We were doing $2 billion a year in cigarette sales and we were a public company and we had just announced guidance, but we finally decided as a team that this is what we needed to do. And we decided not to test it or do it incrementally. We said, no, there's only one player, one, one pharmacy chain in America who could be first at this. It, it needs to be us. And it was such an amazing team effort. I, 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 you know, just as an example, the CFO at the time was hugely passionate about this. And you would say, wow, a CFO, he should be worried about the bottom line and be resisting you. But he fundamentally knew that this was the right purpose for us. The only issue we had was the shareholders. So we said, oh no, you know, one of the problems as we thought about all the stakeholders, the one group we worried about was the shareholders because we were walking away from all these sales and what, you know, how would the stock react? And what was so interesting about this is we announced this in February of 2014. Our stock price went down maybe three to 5% the first couple of days. And 10 days later, our stock price was higher than when we had started. And you'd say, well, how could that be? You just told them you were walking away. And what we heard back was the analyst saying, oh, you're a healthcare company. You're actually putting your, you know, you're, you're, you're walking the talk. And what was so interesting about that is we had owned a healthcare business for five years at that point, but suddenly our actions spoke louder than our words. So listen, it was, it was a great experience, but I would say the things that made me most proud about it were uh, the number of employees. And I'm sure you felt this way, Jeff, just mm -hmm. in the organization who felt so proud to work for a company that would do the right thing, you know, and like yeah. me, many, many, many people had their own stories about losing someone to smoking related illness. So that was, that was a big part of, of the story. But the other really exciting thing was people in the organization said, wow, if we took that kind of a risk and it all worked out, what else could I do? What else am I controlling? <laughs> there where I could lean in a little bit. And I remember in the in the front store team, uh, always they'd been held back from accessing uh, really uh, cutting edge nutrition kind of products because those players didn't want to sell to us. But suddenly the, those players started saying, wow, you made that bold move. We now want to pick one drugstore chain we're going to partner with and it will be you. So I think that also unleashed 
a lot of innovation. And then finally, we got amazing people that come want to work for our business too, because especially young people in 2014 wanted to work for a purpose-driven company. So there were many, many amazing unintended consequences that came out of that decision. And I'm very grateful I got to play a role. Wow, what a powerful story. And I do remember going around the different uh, offices and cubes and, and different places of work, uh, why I quit smoking. Mm, and they would actually right. have, uh, hey, my, I had a parent or a loved one who passed away. I, you know, um, you know, I decided to be there for my children. You know, nice. uh, right, exactly. You know, I mean, you would see their personal story behind each one of them. The, 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 the favorite part of it was for me, just the, the laugh I got out of the, the, the kick butt campaign right. uh, and then seeing the massive cigarette being right. scrunched down, uh, having grown up with two parents who smoked uh, mm -hmm. you know, five packs a day each wow. and me uh, being in the backseat of the car on long 18 hour journeys to Florida. Uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, you know, this whole quit smoking was deeply personal for me, uh, you know, so to watch that and uh, really excited to see it. Bad Advertising Agency is entering our hundredth year of business. From day one, we've specialized in recruitment advertising. And today we develop fully digital strategies across programmatic advertising, search engine marketing, and social media. With a hundred years of experience and knowledge across every industry, we're ready to help our clients navigate what's next. To learn more, visit us at badad.com. Let me talk to pivot just a little bit here because you've given us such wonderful information. But really, I mean, you're just a real person like just all the rest of us. And your family, just like the rest of us, is a very critical part of who you are. You have four mm -hmm. kids, your husband, you have an extended family, your grandfather and uncle were former U.S. senators. But yet I always was remarking about how down to earth you are and how approachable you felt whenever I'd come to your office or you'd see uh, I'd see you in a meeting. How has your family helped to shape your ability to make that human connection? Uh, and this obviously even kind of goes, I know you talked a little bit about your mom, which is, you know, even more impactful knowing that she, she had passed, right. you know, due to lung cancer, but it was such a important part of your life. How did that time in your life really help you make those human connections? Yeah. I mean, I talked about my childhood and that's a big part of it. Um, but the other thing for me that was a really important part of my life was in the 1990s, I was busy at work. I, I was, you know, I had started at CBS in 1992. And by 1998, I had had my fourth child in four and a half years. So I had kids very quickly. And then a year after he was born, I found out I had thyroid cancer. And I went through surgery and a radiation treatment and uh, took a little time off from work, but honestly, not that much because I was really the primary breadwinner in my, in my family. So. I needed to get back to work, but I, I think, I think that experience taught me a lot and made me a better person. And, you know, in a few ways, number one, my family was there for me, so I didn't do it alone. My husband was incredible and is still incredible. My parents, my siblings. I also realized that there are a lot of people walking around with pain that we can't see and I think I'd always been a fairly empathetic person, but, but honestly, that experience really accentuated it for me and made me realize there's sort of a fragility to all of us. And uh, we all have the opportunity to make the people whose lives we touch better. And I felt like I could do that at work. I felt like I could do that in terms of how I interact with people. And I think to this day, you know, I go every year for my, um, my ultrasound to make sure that I'm still cancer free. And every year on that one day I do it, it's an, it's a reminder of how blessed I am and, and, and fortunate I am in a weird way to have gone through that and to have a, you know, a richer perspective on the importance of the people in my life. Those are powerful experiences that certainly will shape all of us, right? And, uh, and they shaped you and your perspective on life, giving you appreciation and gratefulness for, uh, for so much that you have, yet 
um, even though it was traumatic experience that you had to go through. That's yeah, and, and I'm a lucky person. Remarkable. I had great insurance and a great family network, and there are a lot of people who don't. And um, you know, that's 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 something that motivates me in terms of how I think about living my life and serving people. Using that to help other people, using the launching point that you've had. So, wow. Thank you, Helena, for an amazing time on the show today. Uh, thank, thank you, you Jeff. So it's just fun seeing you. You're an amazing leader yourself. Thank you for all you do to help people build their skills in Rhode Island, but also this conversation. It was really fun and nice. Well, this, is, uh, this has been amazing. Well, there you have it, Helena, folks business leader, civic leader, innovator, and just an all around amazing human being. I want to thank you for being on the show today. So we learned so many things anywhere from, you know, what it means to, uh, to be a leader and listening first and just observing and, and being a part of your surroundings, uh, what you could do as a leader in, in terms of establishing a purpose, uh, really returning authority, uh, and establishing some some basic uh, basic concepts of paradox and and allowing people to be able to have discussions around things like their emotions uh, at a leadership team level. We also talked about the impact that leaders can have that are that go well beyond their profit and loss into uh, into the broader community and public and private partnerships and uh, and how that can actually build on their purpose and make it even broader purpose. That's another amazing episode of Growing Your Business with People with our special guest, Helena Folks. For those watching or listening, please like or subscribe. And most importantly, comment. Your feedback will be used on upcoming podcasts. Thank you very much for your time.